On this Thursday night, Ottawa's proposed changes to investigating sexual misconduct in the military. The move survivors and advocates have long called for. It's a good step in the right direction. And why the legislation has its limits. <laughs> Pleas for peace and to protect civilians in Gaza. Israel has the right to defend, not to revenge. The fresh confidence a ceasefire can be reached. Bad Apple, the U.S. Justice Department's new lawsuit and accusations against the tech giant. And an apology nearly seven decades in the making. This was a failure of the system. Manitoba's mea culpa to two men switched at birth. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Jackson Prosco. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Major reforms could be coming to the Canadian military's justice system. The federal government has proposed long-awaited legislation that will strip the Canadian Armed Forces of its ability to investigate and prosecute sexual offences on home soil. Those cases would instead be handled by civilian courts, something advocates and survivors have called for. As Abigail Beeman reports, the changes come after years of recommendations and extensive investigative reporting by Global News. It's change advocates call years in the making. It gives more agency to the survivor um, because they no longer have to go through their commanding officer. That's the to... biggest reform for survivors of military sexual misconduct. If the new legislation becomes law, they can go right to police with a complaint rather than through their chain of command. It was a key recommendation and one of many from separate reports by two former Supreme Court justices. This is the right thing to do for the men and women who serve in the Canadian Armed Forces. Um, we've heard very clearly from, from victims and survivors. Once the legislation is passed, there will be no fight over jurisdiction because it would be entrenched. So it's a good step in the right direction. Beginning in 2021, Global News has reported extensively on allegations of sexual misconduct against senior military members. The government promised culture change and has been criticized for being slow to act. Cultural change is critically important. We're absolutely committed to it, but I also recognize it's a process, not an event. But Thursday's announcement still leaves some issues unaddressed. It only applies to alleged offenses in Canada, with hundreds of Canadian Armed Forces members serving abroad. And it's also no secret our civilian justice system is strained and there's no promise of new resources beyond the minister saying he's working with provincial counterparts. It does seem like a, a major gap and, and I will be pushing on the government to, to look at that as well. The minister says the new legislation tackles nine of the recommendations from the former Supreme Court justices. But after several years, he acknowledges there's still much more work to do, with 119 of the 206 recommendations expected to be completed by the end of this year. Jackson? Abigail Beeman in Ottawa, thanks. Conservative Party leader Pierre Polyev ramped up his campaign to try and pause a scheduled hike of the federal carbon tax on April 1st. After running petitions and attempting to force an emergency debate in the House of Commons, today he urged MPs to back his motion to topple the Liberal government over the planned increase. Our chief political correspondent David Aiken watched the debate play out. David? Well, Jackson, the Conservatives simply did not have the numbers to bring down the government. I did the minority Trudeau government won the day with the support of Bloc Québécois and NDP MPs. The Tories would surely have known they would lose, but for them, the point of the exercise was to force the debate. We as common sense conservatives are ready to restore hope in this country, but it starts with change. We rise today to vote non-confidence in this NDP liberal government. And while the House of Commons spent the day debating that confidence motion, conservatives on the House's Transport Committee were trying to make more political hay at the expense of Environment Minister Stephen Guilbeault. Guilbeault had been quoted in February saying the federal government would no longer invest in new roads. He subsequently corrected himself to say he meant there would be no federal money for a car tunnel in Quebec. But his political opponents were not going to let him off that easy. So this seems to be a, a war on cars. This has been the plan all along. And so what, what Ms. Minister Guibault did was, was just say the quiet part out loud. My comments were specifically related to the project in Quebec. Guilbeault is a favorite target of Conservatives because he is the chief evangelist for the carbon tax. So if you don't understand how the carbon tax affects road infrastructure, I can't help you. But I have a question for you. Is there anything that you would do to walk back 
You personally, would you walk back in any case the 23 percent carbon tax increase in April? Gilbo would only defend the carbon tax in French, uh, noting that, yes, while the carbon tax does go up April 1st, so does the rebate paid to most Canadians. In getting Canada to net zero emissions, but the Institute said industrial carbon pricing systems on large emitters, that's what's in place in Alberta, will make the single biggest contribution to cutting emissions. Jackson. Thanks, David. For the first time, Canada is setting targets for the number of temporary resident arrivals. The immigration minister says in 2023, Canada was home to about 2.5 million temporary residents, roughly 6% of the population. The federal government wants to reduce that to 5% by 2027. The reduction includes temporary foreign workers, but won't apply to the construction or healthcare sectors. It was back to business for the Liberal government of Newfoundland and Labrador today, releasing the provincial budget a day after delaying it due to a rowdy protest. A group of fish harvesters returned to the legislature demanding changes to their industry. They were met by dozens of police officers. Heidi Petrochik reports on the fallout from the dispute that overshadowed Budget Day. A firecracker signaled the start of a second day of protest. Frustrated fish harvesters back before dawn, facing police officers in riot gear outside the Confederation building. This side, stay here. A court injunction granted to the province was meant to prevent protesters from blocking entrances or harassing government employees, but tensions were still high. Although calmer than Wednesday's chaos. Police and protesters clashed, mounted officers pushing their horses back into the crowd. The family of this man, injured in the fray, says 52-year-old Fisher Richard Martin is waiting in a hospital hallway for surgery. Uh, a police officer picked them up from behind and slammed them down on the curb, allegedly. Um, so his hip bone is completely smashed in half. Don't be baited no. into doing something. With the line held outside, government politicians went ahead with the budget inside, but one side of the house remained empty after opposition politicians refused to enter the building, citing solidarity with fish harvesters. The Premier and his Minister of Fisheries led people to, to conclude that they, they heard us and they're actually going to do something. And we find out that nothing was done. The province has repeatedly said it is working on fish harvesters' concerns, but with the affordability crisis felt here as much as anywhere, many feel the financial future is bleak. This fishery has changed dramatically in the last 30 years and there's massive debts now that's being incurred, especially by those young harvesters starting out. Get this hammered out, get it done, we're, and we're going home. The question is whether that will happen now. Heidi Petrachik, Global News, Halifax. In Ukraine, at least 17 people were injured in and around Kyiv in an early morning Russian missile strike. Around 30 missiles were fired on the Ukrainian capital, the first strikes in 44 days. Ukraine says its air defense systems intercepted all the missiles. Injuries on the ground were mainly caused by falling debris. The assault renewed calls from Ukraine's president for more international aid and world unity. The U.S. Secretary of State says there's clear consensus for an immediate and sustained ceasefire in Gaza. Antony Blinken made those remarks on a tour of the Middle East as the U.S. circulates a draft U.N. resolution that calls for a humanitarian pause in exchange for the release of hostages. As Crystal Gamansing reports, European leaders are also increasing pressure on Israel to do more to help civilians. European leaders managed to unite around protection for Ukrainians. Now leaders are looking for consensus on civilian lives in Gaza. Israel has the right to defend, not to revenge. The European Union foreign policy chief has aggressively and repeatedly called on Israel to do more to protect civilians and permit more aid to enter Gaza. America's top diplomat is meeting with Middle Eastern leaders, selling a draft ceasefire resolution it submitted to the United Nations Security Council. The U.S. vetoed three previous council resolutions. The difference this time seems to be the temporary ceasefire is linked to the return of hostages. More than 100 Israeli hostages are believed to be held in Gaza, captured following the deadly October 7th attacks orchestrated by Hamas. 
In an interview with an Arab network, Antony Blinken sounded confident a new temporary ceasefire would be achieved. We worked very hard to put a strong proposal on the table. We did that. Hamas wouldn't accept it. They came back with uh, other uh, requests, other, other demands. The negotiators are working on that right now. But I believe it's very much doable. Israel launched fresh ground and air assaults on Gaza Thursday. The Israeli government says a delegation will go to Doha Friday for talks, but author Guy Ziv says peace will do little for Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's career. What we're seeing today is a Netanyahu who's in deep political trouble. Uh, he has lost a tremendous amount of support, so it is in his interest to continue this war. <laughs> In a national TV address Wednesday, the Israeli prime minister said he approved military plans to enter Rafah and told the American president the operation was happening. Crystal Gamansing, Global News, London. The U.S. Justice Department and 15 states have filed an antitrust lawsuit against Apple, accusing the company of illegally monopolizing the smartphone market. We allege that Apple has employed a strategy that relies on exclusionary anti-competitive conduct that hurts both consumers and developers. If left unchallenged, Apple will only continue to strengthen its smartphone monopoly. The 88-page lawsuit accuses Apple of intending to keep consumers using their iPhones instead of switching to other devices. In a statement, Apple said the lawsuit could set a dangerous precedent and hinder its ability to make compelling consumer-friendly technology. Apple is the latest in a string of big tech companies to be sued by U.S. regulators, including Meta and Amazon. In a medical first, doctors in the U.S. have transplanted a genetically modified pig kidney into a living patient. 62-year-old Richard Slayman, who has end-stage renal disease, underwent the four-hour operation last Saturday. He's been recovering well, and so far there are no signs of rejection. A tribute to Brian Mulroney at his childhood home. Coming up, we visit the neighborhood where he grew up. The family of Brian Mulroney gathered privately around the late former prime minister. An emotional occasion as he lies in repose at Montreal's St. Patrick's Basilica. Mulroney will remain there until his state funeral this Saturday. Among those who paid respects today, former Quebec Premier Lucien Bouchard, one of Mulroney's former cabinet ministers and an old friend. I think that someone like Brian Mulroney leaves behind him hope for young people. Let them think about Brian Mulroney, a young guy from Bicomo. Mulroney would often call himself the little guy from Bay Como, his hometown along Quebec's North Shore. Our Mike Armstrong is there for a glimpse of Mulroney's early life. If you stand on this street corner in Bay Como, you're basically in the middle of Brian Mulroney's childhood. It is in every direction, especially that one. So let's start up the hill. When Ben and Irene Mulroney brought their first son home from the hospital, they lived at 132 Champlain Street. Brian was their third child, but the first born in Baie They moved several years later further down the street. Most of Mulroney's childhood was spent at 99 Champlain Street. If you peek in, you can see the current owner's small tribute. The Mulroney's eventually moved again, and again, it was just further down Champlain to 79. Now, down the hill is the hotel where a teenage Mulroney had one of his first jobs, washing glasses in the bar. A little further, there's the post office, another early job. He was a sort. Now, near the crest of the hill is the church where Mulroney was baptized. St. Emily was where his mother went to Mass every Sunday and where Brian served as an altar boy. It was also for a time his school, classes were in the basement, and there was the occasional bingo. In his memoirs, Mulroney remembers winning a turkey and four pounds of butter, which he and his mother proudly carried home. Now, Mulroney's last visit to his hometown was in 2019. It was a ceremony at St. Emily to unveil a bust in his honor. Mulroney talked about his love affair with the town and how it shaped him. I suppose that if there were a model for a growing Canada, it would have been Bay Como, a small town with big dreams. 
The bust unveiled on that day is now in front of City Hall. And as dignitaries from around the world go to Montreal for the state funeral to remember this man, people here will watch from afar, sort of. With the blessing of the Mulroney family, the town of Bay Como is going to be showing the funeral at St. Amélie, up the hill. Mike Armstrong, Global News, Bay Como, Quebec. Switched at birth ahead, what led to a formal apology from Manitoba's premier. The province of Manitoba has formally apologized to two men switched at birth nearly 70 years ago. Edward Ambrose and Richard Bouvet were born in the same hospital on the same day in 1955. While they can't change the past, they hope today's apology is an important step forward. Marnie Blunt reports. First, there was a warm, heartfelt welcome. Then came the words two Manitoba men have spent years waiting to hear. I rise today to deliver an apology that has been a long time coming for actions that harm two children, two sets of parents, and two families across many generations. An official apology from Manitoba's premier, nearly 70 years in the making, to two men switched at birth in 1955. Ed and Richard are here today as two people wronged by the Manitoba government and the institutions they should have been able to trust. Edward Ambrose and Richard Bouvet were born on June 28, 1955, at a hospital in the small rural community of Arburg, north of Winnipeg. They were sent home with each other's parents. Now the two say they feel gratitude and relief. He came across as apologizing for all of Manitoba, and it meant it, meant it was good. I, I feel relief. And I think he did, like I say, he did a fantastic job. I think he put everything at peace. The discovery of the switch was made two years ago, thanks to at-home DNA testing kits, which led to a meeting that brought a range of emotions. It's emotional uh, for meeting someone who, who is you, but I am him. Bouvet discovered he was Ukrainian and Jewish. He had been raised Métis, attended day school, and was taken from his family during the 60s scoop. Now, they're trying to find the good in what they can't change. It's been emotional, but it's been happy, it's been positive, and uh, no one is losing anything by this, but our family is just expanding and growing. This is the third known case of babies being switched at birth in Manitoba. Two other cases happened in 1975, both at the same hospital in Norway House in northern Manitoba. Jackson? Marnie Blunt in Winnipeg, thanks. Next, how some famous friends are remembering the late Brian Mulrooney. Well, as Canadians pay their respects to Brian Mulrooney, some high-profile figures are sharing their own stories of the late Prime Minister, and one theme stands out in many of the tales. Eric Sorensen gives us insight into Brian Mulrooney, the crooner. Even a hockey hero in his prime was starstruck. We were so proud and so excited to go to 24 Sussex. And Wayne Gretzky remembers another time, a music icon just as anxious before singing in front of Brian and Mila Mulrooney. I said, how are you doing? He goes, I'm so nervous. I said, nervous? You're Michael Bublé. He goes, the Prime Minister of Canada and his wife are here, Wayne. I'm very nervous. Gretzky chatting with the former Prime Minister's son, Ben Mulrooney, one of several public figures telling personal stories for a special on Chorus Radio. We thought this side of him was something worth sharing. And if there was one side of Brian Mulrooney that kept coming up, it was this. Music and singing. Canadians remember the famous Shamrock Summit when Mulrooney crooned an Irish favorite with U.S. President Reagan. Well, it wasn't a one-off. President George W. Bush recalls a dinner with Mulrooney. When he popped up at the table uh, when we were visiting up in Canada and started singing, I said, oh my God, what is this guy up to? And it was clear that he loved to sing, and frankly, I was uh, amazed. Another president, Bill Clinton, talking to Ben Mulrooney. The older he got, the more he would sing. He sang at the drop of a hat. 
Thank <laughs> you, goodness he had a good voice. He <laughs> did. We'd all been miserable because he would have sung anyway. <laughs> Brian Mulroney loved to sing, officially and unofficially. He referred to himself as a frustrated saloon singer. I think he wanted us to remember him at his most joyful, and that's when he was singing. Late in life, Mulroney audio recorded several songs just for his family. These are mostly for the grandchildren, and I thought, that Mila particularly thought, it would be nice for them. One was Paper Doll. I'm gonna buy a paper doll that I can call my own. A favorite, too, of Michael Buble, a close friend. A doll that other fellas cannot steal. They sang together the last time they spoke by video. And when the camera panned back, I could see the whole family was there surrounding him. And, uh, and everyone was very emotional, and I was very emotional. You never had to ask Brian Mulrooney twice to sing, here joining the choir honoring him in his hometown. I should be shaking hands, sing With a microphone in hand, it's hard to know what Brian Mulrooney really preferred, to make a speech or sing a song. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. And there will be a Chorus Radio Network special remembering Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, a family tribute. It will be hosted by his son, Ben Mulroney, on Saturday afternoon. And Donna Friesen will host live coverage of Brian Mulroney's state funeral in Montreal Saturday morning, right here on Global. And that's Global National for this Thursday. I'm Jackson Prosco. Tonight's Your Canada is the Notre Dame Basilica in Montreal, where Brian Mulroney's state funeral will be held on Saturday. Thanks for watching and have a great night.